and I quote, the people of this country have a particular antipathy to wearing costumes different from their own. And if the robe were made out of velvet or silk, it would be in contravention of Muslim law, nor could he wear a pendant with a portrait of the queen or with the likeness of any created being. So the Nizam of Hyderabad did not go to Allahabad to be invested with the order, but stayed at home. In fact, when the patent, the official document, making him a knight of the order, arrived in Hyderabad with the cloak and the insignia, he made proper reverence to these objects, we're told, but he did not put on the cloak. So he said, thank you very much, and probably put it in a cupboard. Another problem um, arose because the recipients of, you see, look, he's wearing the mantle of the Star of India. He looks most splendid in it. Another problem arose because the recipients of a knighthood had to sign a document. The British asked them to sign a document promising that the cloak would be returned to the British when the recipient died. The point here from the British, uh, from the British point of view was that the knighthood was not hereditary. So you were given uh, membership of the order and you became Sir so-and-so, so-and-so, but your son did not have the right to call himself Sir so-and-so, so-and-so, so you had to give the cloak back. Um, but giving a ceremonial a garment like this and then insisting on having, I need a strong man. I can't open that. Um, giving somebody a cloak and then, thank you very much, and then asking to have it back again, I mean, this was seen as a very strange and insulting action. So a lesser problem, a lesser problem, this is the second Begum to be, uh, to be given the order. A lesser problem was a refusal by the Begum of Bhopal, the, the only, uh, it was, uh, her predecessor who was the only woman to receive the star in the first round. They refused to be called Lady Knights, which indeed is an absolutely ridiculous title. They said, you know, we are monarchs and so we're knights, just like anybody else. 20 years later, <laughs> we should take their coat off them. Yes. <laughs> Just like the British were doing when they were giving the mantle, we take it away again. Um, 20 years later, when Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India in 1878, she instituted two more orders of chivalry. The first was the most eminent order of the Indian Empire, divided in 1887 into three ranks of grand, knight grand commander, knight commander and companion. And here we see the Maharaja of Gondal in a 1911 photograph during his visit to London for the coronation of George V, wearing the mantle, collar and star of a knight grand commander of the Order of the Indian Empire. And the names GCSI after his name mean that he already had the Star of India. So he's already a grand commander of the Star of India. Now he gets the, the Order of the Indian Empire. So he's, he's a sir twice over. And here you have, I mean, I had to show a picture of Lord Curzon as we're here in the Victoria Memorial Hall. This is Lord Curzon looking just as nasty as I think he was in real life. I mean, he's got a nasty face, look. But he is wearing the mantle, the dark blue mantle of a knight grand commander of the Order of the Indian Empire. Again, it has a star on the left shoulder. And the collar, also only worn by Knight's Grand Commanders, was made of gold and composed of alternating golden elephants, Indian roses and peacocks. In 1878, Queen Victoria also instituted an order specifically for women, the Imperial Order of the Crown of India. And uh, here you see um, it being worn. Now, the whole point is that similar, equally elaborate decorations already existed in Britain. They had different names, but they had just as many subgroups and medals. 
The new Indian decorations were to reward the high British officials ruling India, the so-called proconsular elite, but also the Indian princely elite. They and their respective civil servants were all to be tied into the same system and ranked. An important prince could expect to be made a knight grand commander of the Order of the Star of India or of the Indian Empire, just as his father and grandfather had been and just as British viceroys and governors were. And then their wives of the viceroys and governors and of the princes were included in the Order of the Crown of India for women. I mean, here's an example, Lord Harding the Viceroy, and you can see that he's absolutely covered in different medals. I mean, he's got, we can see, I can see five of them on the photograph, and his wife is wearing two or three. Um, I mean, the historian David Canadine says some of these people were like walking Christmas trees. You know, they had, they had sort of decorations all over them. You'll see some photographs in a moment. So, Lord, Lord, Lord Harding was the Viceroy at the time, as you know, of the 1911 Delhi Durbar, and so, of course, therefore, he, he, was, you know, he was the recipient of extra honours. Career civil servants could expect to be given a decoration once they had reached a certain rank in the civil service or in the army. And you will be glad to know that the present British High Commissioner in Delhi, Sir Dominic Asquith, has the letters KCMG after his name indicating, you see, this is because of his rank. He's very important in the British system if he's High Commissioner in India. And so he's been made a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. A hundred years ago, he would have been a Knight Commander of the Order of the Star of India, and he would also have got the same decoration um, of the Indian Empire. So two elite groups of British officials and uh, of, of, of British and Indians were entitled and were expected to wear the mantle and collar of one of the Indian orders on formal occasions. And of course, they all recognized each other's decorations and knew how high up in the rank they had got. So here we see George V awarding the Order of the Star of India to Ganga Singh Maharaja of Bikaner at the Delhi Durbar of 1911. And if you look at the picture, look at how many people there are wearing the pale blue mantle. There are several in the audience, and there are several of the British officials helping the king, and they're all wearing the pale blue mantle of the Star of India as well. So there are two Indian princes, at least, in the audience, and several other British officials. The Star of India continued to be awarded up to 1948, when it fell, for obvious reasons, into abeyance. The last surviving knight of the order, this is actually his father, it was this man's son. Look, you see, he's wearing, you can see the Star of India, the Indian Empire. His son, uh, the Maharaja of Alwar, he only died in the year 2009. So now that order really has, those orders really have died out. They really are extinct. Now, you might think, and I might think, that the award of the same orders to British and Indian grandees made for equality between them, but nothing could be further from the truth. As I said earlier, the British ruled a third of the territory of India through local rulers, but it was the British who decided which rulers qualified. Of course it was clear that a ruler as grand as the Maharaja of Mysore or the Nizam of Hyderabad should be recognized and treated with as much respect as a European king. But there was a problem about how many of the lesser princes should be recognized. The Indian princes and their titles are listed in a wonderful book with the title The Golden Book of India, a genealogical and biographical dictionary of the ruling princes, chiefs, nobles, and other personages. I mean, this is just a page at random. It was compiled by Sir Roper Lethbridge and published in two editions in 1893 and 1900. In his preface, Lethbridge makes clear that it is the British government which decides whether a title, no matter how ancient, can be recognized or not. Uh, Sir Roper says, Indian titles are officially defined to be either by grant from government, that is, 
a new creation by Her Imperial Majesty the Queen Empress through her representative, or by dissent or well-established usage. The government, this is the British government, alone can be the judge of the validity of claims and of their relative strength in the case of titles acquired by dissent or by well-established usage. Because Lethbridge says there is no central authority, in, in, see in, in Britain there was a college of arms that could decide all these things. In India there's no central office who can decide um, which Indian titles can be recognised and he gives an example. He says that it gives rise to great injustice. For instance, in the lower provinces of Bengal alone, there are at this moment some hundreds of families possessing and not uncommonly using titles derived from extinct dynasties or from common repute, yet not hitherto formally recognised by the British government. These, sometimes justly, but more frequently unjustly, are in this way placed in a false and invidious position. So you have all these princes that Queen Victoria is ruling through, and subsequently George V, but it's Britain who decides whether they're princes or not. Lethbridge simply lists all the Indian rulers in alphabetical order, but there was a strict order of precedence, jealously enforced by the Indian princes themselves. One of the ways that precedence among the princes was made not so much visible as audible was when a number of guns were fired by the British to salute a particular prince. So of the 500 princes just mentioned, only 103 ruled over so-called salute states. And a salute state was a state whose ruler was given a gun salute when they you know, met with the Viceroy or whoever it was at a Durbar, and the number of guns fired in the salute denoted the importance and rank of that territory. The five most important territories, Hyderabad, Gwalior, Mysore, Kashmir and Baroda, were accorded 21 guns. It, the, the, the President of India gets 21 guns when he meets with a foreign, you know, the head of a foreign state. So 21 guns was the top, other states were given 19 guns, 17 guns, 15 guns, 13 guns, 11 guns, and 9 guns. Cochin was a 17-gun state. And you have to imagine that the particular prince, dressed up in all his finery and everything, he's counting in his head. Have I actually got 17 guns or not? Because if he was supposed to get 17 guns and only got 16, I mean, they'd be hell to pay. The Empress, or Emperor by contrast, was given the so-called Imperial Salute of 101 guns, and the Queen the Royal Salute of 31 guns. Now, again to, to quote uh, the historian David Canadine, his point in his book Orientalism, how the British saw their empire, is that the British came to India as to other colonies and conquered territories, and I come from a little conquered territory called Ireland. They, they came to these conquered territories bringing with them the rigidly hierarchical concept of society that they knew from home, and they applied it to India. Their partial understanding of the caste system made them think, says Canadine, that it mirrored the stratified society they were accustomed to in Britain. You have only to read the heated debates about extension of the franchise, the, the reform bills of 1832 and 1867 in the British Parliament, trying to decide who should be allowed to vote in Britain. And you see how incredibly stratified Britain was and how the vast mass of people were uneducated, even illiterate, and nobody thought that they could possibly vote because they wouldn't know how to vote. And so this... this the, this, this ranking of, of, um, of different classes was something that the British brought to India. The system of honours and decorations, graded as we saw, was a way to distinguish further the upper levels of this stratified society and make these princes and nobles compete in their loyalty and service to the crown. 
no matter how friendly Queen Victoria was to Indian princes when they came to visit her in her house at Osborne on the Isle of Wight or in Windsor Castle. And she always welcomed them, provided, of course, that they remained exotic exhibits by wearing their most colourful Indian dress. Indians were not allowed to rule India, take any senior positions in the Indian civil service until, you know, the, 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 um, the uh, India Act of, of, of 1919, too little, too late. Nor, no matter how qualified, might they act as judges over Europeans in the courts until the passing of the so-called Ilbert Bill of 1884 during Lord Ripon's viceroyalty. Honours, too, were a means of exerting control. We see this in the outraged reaction to the Gaikwar of Baroda who appeared at the 1911 Durbar before George V and Queen Mary, not wearing, as was expected, the ceremonial dress of the Star of India. He wore a simple, you know, white uh, coat. He carried a walking stick. He marched up. King Emperor bowed, you know, turned his back, walked off back, swinging his stick. And this was regarded as an absolutely appalling act. He was accused in the English language press in India and in England of a calculated insult, which was even considered to be seditious. And of course, 1911, there were uh, newsreels. There, there's film, you can go onto YouTube and you can see them. And it illustrated the difference between his, you know, bow, bow to the king, and the low obeisances of the other princes. And they also showed his simple dress. He was not wearing, you know, the, the Order of the Indian Empire or the mantle of the, um, of, of the Star of India. So um, giving somebody an honor and a costume is a means of controlling them. You then expect them to wear it on the occasions when you have told them that they will wear it. The Indian princes, so important to the British rulers, were finally given a forum in which to articulate their views collectively when the Chamber of Princes was established in 1920 after the aforementioned Government of India Act was given royal assent. The Chamber of Princes first met on the 8th of February 1921 and initially consisted of only 120 members. Of the 120 members, 108 represented the more significant states and were members in their own right, while the remaining 12 seats represented a further 127 states. That left 327 unrepresented. Some rulers refused to join, Baroda, Gwalior, Holkar. So again, awarding such a forum to the Indian princes, rather like the Order of the Star of India or the Order of the British Empire, looks on the surface like an act of respect and recognition, but in fact it's an act of condescension. Now here I'd like to, oh here's the Chamber of Princes, and you can see how many of them are wearing their star, yeah? There's quite a number if you look closely at the photograph. So here I'd like to draw back from India for a moment and put what I've been saying into a wider context. I'm sorry to keep coughing, but I contracted a cold in Delhi. Delhi was very cold, and I got a cold. <coughs> so I have to cough every now and again. So if I can draw back for a second and not show you any pictures. I came to think about the Order of the Star of India because I'm working uh, uh, um, at the moment, as Dr. Sengupta said, on um, a project looking at how the new emperors of the 19th century projected their power. And again, as he said, there were, at various times during the 19th century, new emperors in France, Austria, Germany, Brazil, Mexico, and of course in India. What interests me is that all of these rulers, who from 1804 to 1952, who called themselves emperors, what interests me is how they created and sustained a panoply of power to project themselves as emperors. They all had to establish an imperial court with all kinds of gorgeously dressed court officials. They had to invent an imperial tradition or draw on an existing one. They had to create imperial spaces, architecture, city streets, squares. They had to create images and statues and organize splendid ceremonies and festivals. So I'm asking how did all this, how is it 
constituted, how did it evolve, how did it enable the emperors to perform their imperial role, how did they project their majesty to the people they were governing, and at the same time, how did they project it to the wider world. The 19th century was a period of huge expansion in the public sphere and of the development of all kinds of media, not just print media, but photography and film. So again, I'm asking, how did these emperors use these media? So you can see how all these questions are very pertinent to India during the British Raj. But focusing our attention once more on the system of orders of chivalry as a mechanism with which to compare the various empires, let us just, just look very briefly at the different empires in turn. The Austrian Empire had arisen out of the Holy Roman Empire, which was in existence since the year 800 Common Era. The last Holy Roman Emperor, Franz II, was the elected overlord of a huge European territory the, of the German-speaking world. But thanks to Napoleon, he had to bring the Holy Roman Empire to an end after a thousand years in 1806. Seeing what was coming, that he, the Holy Roman Empire would have to come to an end, two years before, in 1804, he had already created himself the hereditary emperor of Austria. So Franz II then becomes Franz I, very confusing. Of course, Austria, uh, Austria, I have to say, if anything, was even more obsessed with titles and honors than Britain. They already had the ancient order of the Golden Fleece, which is you know, a medieval uh, order of chivalry. And this is Franz wearing the gorgeous costume of a knight of the, of the golden fleece. And he's got the golden fleece. Can you see thing like a gold sheep hanging from, a, from, the, from the collar around his neck? That's the golden fleece. Um, so they already had this ancient order, but that wasn't enough. He then created another one, which was the o o Imperial Austrian Order of Leopold. So this is his first imperial order as Emperor of Austria. He called it after his father. And until they reformed this order in 1884, um, they again had all these different ranks, and each rank entitled you to a different role at the Austrian court. Some of them became privy councillors, some of them um, were made barons automatically, and it was always a hereditary dignity and so on. So it was an extremely evolved system. Very different is the order awarded by the German emperors. Now, they came into existence in 1871, common era. This is the order of the Iron Cross. And of course, they're obviously trying to, trying to make themselves look different from the Austrians, among other things. Yeah? The Austrians are all gold and you know, hanging sheep and whatnot. And this is iron and, and so on. It's based on the order created by the Prussian king, Friedrich Wilhelm II in 1813 to reward bravery on the battlefield against Napoleon's army. And it was open to all soldiers, not just noblemen, not just officers. And it was first instituted in 1813 in three classes, and then it was, it was revived again when, the, uh, uh, when Wilhelm I became the first uh, German emperor. And it is actually made of iron in a silver setting and is supposed to, to show Prussian duty, toughness and restraint rather than luxury. Here's another example, the emperors of Brazil. Now, they only...